uh, in the second, if I can get there myself, my goodness sakes alive. Second Samuel chapter six, verse number one. We're going to read down through verse number 11. And, uh, I want to preach a message today entitled this. Good intentions are not good enough. This is a message to the church. It's a message to, well, it, it's to say, to lost people too. But primarily I want to feed the flock. Good intentions are not good enough. Uh, this is a, we're studying the life of David. This is a very unusual thing that happens here with David's life. But boy, there's a rich lesson for God's people here. Mm, mm, hope you get a hold of it. Verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of uh, Judah to bring up thence. And well, here it is, folks, to bring up thence the ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. If you know much about the ark, you know this. Let's just stop here for just a second. That ark would uh, not not exactly maybe the size of this here communion table, but close to it. It was uh, two cubits and two cubits and four cubits, and, and uh, it, uh, it was wood made out of a K of wood, and it was overlaid with gold. And then on the top of it, it had what's called, the lid was called a mercy seat. They called a mercy seat. And that mercy seat was pure gold, and it had two cherubims that folded their wings in toward each other. I've shown pictures of it here before. But just so you can get a visualization, the Ark of the Covenant is what he's talking about here. For about 70 years, the Ark has been out of whack. It hadn't been where it's supposed to be. God was not in the center of their life. We'll talk about the Ark a little bit more, but let's read. Verse number 3, and they set the Ark of God. Now here's the deal. They're getting made. David wants to move the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem as he's establishing the kingdom, as he becomes the king, and he's wanting to make... God, the center of government. Oh, it's a wonderful passage. And verse 3 says, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. I want you to underline that new cart. And brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Geba, Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries, on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. <clears throat> and David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? If they were going to give another title to this message, it would be that phrase, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? You might want to underline that. Verse 10, So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him in the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Lord, help us to preach today, I pray in Jesus' name, and feed the flock. Amen. You get the same account, except maybe with a little more detail in the book of First Chronicles chapter 13. As I said, this message is good intentions are not good enough, or how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Giving just a little bit of history on the Ark of the Covenant as I started a while ago, God instructed Moses back in the book of Exodus chapter 25 uh, about making the tabernacle. And the first piece of furniture that was to be made was this Ark of the Covenant that I mentioned a while ago. The Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place. There was the outer court, then the holy place, and then the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant was set behind that, and uh, it was right behind the uh, uh, veil, and the ark was where the glory of God dwelt. It's where God dwelt in the midst and among his people was on that ark. Okay, Having the ark was the symbol that God was in the, and the, literally where God's presence abided. He said, I'll dwell between the cherubims. Okay, On the mercy seat at the ark. This ark was the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle. And he instructed him how to make it. God told Moses. Don't make it how you want to make it. You make it like a, how you doing back there? Good to see you. And uh, he said, you make it like I tell you to make it. He said, be sure that you make it according to the pattern that I give, gave you in the wilderness. Okay? So 
uh, he not only told him how to make it, he also told him where to put it. <clears throat> put it in the most holy place. You just don't put it in where you want to, Moses. You put it in the most holy place, just on the other side of the veil. Then he also told him uh, what to put in it. He said, Moses, I want you to put the plates or the tablets of the stone, the Ten Commandments. He said, I want those put in there, the ones that he made afterward, after he broke the first ones. And then he said, I want you to put a pot of manna in there. And then I said, I want you to put Aaron's rod that budded in there. Okay? Now, those three things are very important. Putting the, tab, the table of the commandments in there symbolized that Jesus, this ark is a picture. And here, let's, hang on now. This ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. There's three arcs in the Bible. There's uh, Noah's ark, the ark of the covenant, and the ark that Moses was put in. They speak of deliverance. They all speak of Jesus Christ and what he does for us when he saves us. The ark of Noah teaches us that he delivers us from the destruction of sin. Uh, the ark here teaches us that he delivers us from the condemnation of the law. And uh, the ark of Moses teaches he saves us from the power of Satan. You study the ark, as, the three arcs of the Bible is a wonderful study. But he takes these, uh, he took the, the law and he put it in there. That tells us that Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly. Those tablets were not put in there broken. Jesus never did break the law. He never sinned. It's a picture of Christ keeping the law perfectly. You and I don't do that, do we? We've all broken the law of God. We are all guilty of breaking. He said if you've been one point offended, you're guilty of all. But Jesus Christ did no sin. He is God in the flesh and is teaching us that he kept the law and he is thus a perfect, sinless sacrifice for the sins of mankind. You put the pot of manna in there. Manna came down from heaven and sustained them and fed them. So he's saying that as his Savior, he's going to sustain you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. Then he put the Aaron's rod that budded. The Aaron's rod that budded was a, was a branch. And what happened was, if you go back in the story, they just had a rebellion going on, and the way they were going to prove who was the true man of God was, watch this, that they took their rods, and the rod that budded would be evidence of the true man of God. And Aaron's rod's the one that budded, and that's because God had ordained Aaron to be the priest, and his rod budded. But it had more meaning than that. The bud mean that, 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 that when you cut a rod off, it's dead. That rod budded. Jesus was cut off at Calvary, died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. The, the rod budding speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it speaks of the resurrected life that you and I have, that we are risen in newness of life in Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. He has given us eternal life, the rod budded. Amen? And uh, we have that in Christ. So it's all a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Exodus 25, verse 22, this is very important. After God told Moses about where, how to make the ark, where to put the ark, what to put in the ark, he also told him, he said, there will I meet with thee. I'm not meeting with you outside the court. I'm not meeting you at, at the uh, brazen altar. I'm not meeting you at the labor. He said, it's at the Ark of the Covenant is where I will meet you. In other words, this. If you're going to meet God, you're going to have to meet him at the Ark of the Covenant, which is a picture of Jesus Christ our Lord, crucified, buried, and risen again, God and man at the mercy seat of God. And here's something else they did. When they killed that at the Day of Atonement, killed that bullock, they took the blood and they sprinkled it on the lid of that mercy seat, and the satisfaction of God for the penalty of death was paid for it. Somebody had died, the blood was shed, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, and because the law had been satisfied, then God could extend mercy to the person who placed his faith in that shed blood sacrifice. And that's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, he took his own blood, the Bible said in the book of Hebrews, and sprinkled his own blood on the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. And now you and I have access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ because he is the only acceptable sacrifice to a holy God. You and I could burn in hell for a million years and never pay for our sin. 
we could, we could, we could die for our sins a thousand times and never pay for our sin. Jesus Christ's sinless blood was the only thing that would pay for our sins and satisfy the just demands of a holy God. That ark is important to you and I. It is the place where God will meet you. He will not meet you at any other place. He meets you at the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that shed blood, as I said, was sprinkled on the mercy seat, showing that God was satisfied and accepted. And we're accepted in the beloved when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we came, we on, I came to 28 years of age. I came to the mercy seat one day and I approached God. And I approached him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, God, I believe Jesus on him, that he died for my sin, that he was buried, that he rose again. Lord, I believe that his blood is sufficient. And Lord, I'm casting my soul upon that redemptive work of Jesus Christ, that blood that was sprinkled. What can take away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Oh, this world hates the blood redemption. They want to they do better and get better and, and they baptize you and categorize you and weld you and iron you all up and everything else, but they're never going to save you. Amen? It takes the blood to save you. So anyway, it teaches us this, that Jesus Christ, that ark is a type of him. It's the only way to God. That blood is required to approach him and to worship him. And it's exclusive. There is no other way to God. Now the ark, as I said, had been kind of in limbo in a sense for about 70 years. Because Israel thought they'd have a, they tried to use it as a religious relic and took it into war with them. And the Philistines whipped them because they weren't right with God. They were just playing. They were being phony and fake and hypocritical. And the Philistines captured the ark. But that old ark cursed the Philistines. They got emrods and all other kind of trouble with it. And they couldn't stand to have it in their midst. And so you know what they did? They put it on a new cart and sent it back to Israel, and it got up there and stayed. Now, it, it was carried by the Philistines on a new cart. Now, David, now listen, David's just a lot like you and I. There's a side of David that is after the heart of God, and there's a side of David that's dumber than a box of rocks. There's a side of David that's absolutely spiritual, loves God, wants to do what God wants to do, has a heart for God. Oh, how I love Jesus. There's a side of David that's wicked and sorry as hell. You have, if you're saved, a new man and an old man. God's not in the old man improvement business. That's why you got to be born again, brother. And so David, he, he's, here he is. David has a godly, wonderful desire, and he's wise. He said, we're not leaving that ark back down the wilderness. I'm going to be king. Christ is going to be in the center of the government. Let's get that ark and let's bring it up to Jerusalem, put it right smack dab in the middle of our nation, and Christ is going to rule, and Christ is going to reign, and Christ is going to say what's right and what's wrong, and we're going to worship the Lord. And so this was a marvelous thing. He wanted to unify the nation around God, around the Messiah. He wanted to exalt God and make God preeminent and central to the nation. He wanted to strengthen the nation with the presence of God and the precepts of God. And by the way, folks, that's mighty good intentions, and wouldn't you like to have a president that would say that? We want God in the center of our government. Well, this is a good leader. What a good leader will do and should do is get Christ at the center of everything going on. By the way, this is what a good daddy will do. He will get Christ at the center of his home. This is what a good church will do. He'll make sure Christ is in the center, it's in central to the church. So it's not just the nation and the home, but the church, but also individually. You and I need to make sure that the ark of the Lord is in the holy place where it needs to be, your heart. You see, Van, oftentimes I've seen him teach teenage kids this one great truth. He said, some of you kids, you're saved. But he said, Jesus, you've got him over here on the side part of your heart. Jesus wants to be on the throne of your heart. See, that was the center throne, the throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And I'm telling you, we, God needs to be the central, most preeminent. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. But. The question remains, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? How do we put God at the heart of our personal being? How do we put God at the heart of our home? We talked about some of that in the Sunday school class in our church, our education, our government. The first thing I want to say to you today is this. David had a passion for Christ to be at the center of his life, the passion. You know what you need? We need an old-time move of the Holy Ghost that says, I want to put Christ first in my life. Psalms 132, verse 3 through 8. I want to read it to you here if I can. This is what David said in one of the Psalms. He said, surely, watch this, listen to it. I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed, 
I will not give sleep to mine eyelids or slumber to mine eyelids until I find a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. You know what David said? I don't go to bed at night until I put God at the center of my heart. I don't get up in the mornings without putting God at the center of my life. You say, Reggie, how do I do that? I'm just going to give you some practical things. If you want to put the ark at your house in the center of your life, make sure that you read your Bible regularly, daily. Thank you. I, last I heard, the Christians ought to read the Bible. I'm going to tell you something. Did you know he's called the Word? You put the Word at the center of you. You can't put him in the center of your life without reading this Bible. You're going to have to read your Bible. And by the way, you need to do more than read your Bible. You need to study your Bible. You need to dig into it, meditate into it, compare Scripture, search things out. And then I would encourage, if you want to have the Lord in the middle of your heart, sing to the Lord. Amen. I believe God dwells in the midst of the praises of his people, the Bible said. Then let me say another thing. Be at church. Amen. And you're here today, so I, I don't know who I preach to about that. But I'm going to say something to you. I'm glad my mom and dad went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I really am. I'll tell you what, they enriched my life by that. I learned things on Sunday night I'd have never got on Sunday morning. I learned things on Wednesday night I'd have never got. One of the greatest things I learned on Wednesday night was faithfulness. I can still see old Stanley Hino kneeling down on his knees and praying for folks that had been coming visiting church, praying for folks in the community to get saved. And every Wednesday night, just like an old clock, he had a kneeling at that altar, praying faithful, faithful. You know what he did? He put something in this little country boy's heart. Reggie, be at church. Reggie, be at church. If you really want to see God do something in your life, you really want to see God do something in your family, be faithful. Be faithful. Just keep on keeping on. Don't, don't, don't quit. Don't stop. Don't stutter and don't back up. Just keep being faithful. You want to be blessed to God, be faithful. And then another thing, if you want God to send your life, help in the work of God. I appreciate everybody going down to camp. I appreciate all the good work that's done all over this church by everybody. My goodness, how nice the yard looks and how nice the garden tomb looks and how all the work that's been done going on out here. Goodness sakes, I'm thankful for it. But learn to pray. Oh, spend time with God. Man, I'll tell you what, me and Karen, we've been walking around together. And we've learned something. Me and Karen, we've been walking together, and sometimes in the morning and the evening, we're walking side by side. And we're going around through them. We decided we'd pray one time. And, you know, we got to pray and walked into a walnut tree, like knocked us out. <laughs> no, I'm lying to you. We pray with our eyes open while we're walking. You say, can you pray with your eyes open? I've done it way more times than you'd ever dream about. I'm talking about learn how to pray. Hey, someday take a day off, just you and the Lord type of picnic. You want God in the heart of your life. You want God the center of your life. You're going to have to take some time to do that. I know this ain't nothing you don't already know, just reminding you. But then David had this passion for God. He put Christ at the center. You know, our founders understood this. You study the documents. Look at the buildings. Look at what they wrote in the concrete or the, the granite of our buildings. Look at the laws that they made in this land. Oh, I know they weren't perfect, but oh, I'm going to tell you something. They put the creator at the center of this thing. And I thank God for, our, for the old missionaries who went throughout the country preaching and starting Brush Arbor revivals and building churches. Oh, aren't you glad we don't have mosques all over the country? And if we ain't careful, they will be. If you don't, I want to tell you kids something. You listen to me real well. If you're going to reject God and you don't give a flip at the church house doors, hey, you listen to me. I said if you don't give a rip if the church house doors open, if it quits and you'll, you'll fall off the church like a dead tick, you get ready for mosques to be built in your town. England got to where they didn't care if they went to church or not. Now there's more mosques than there are churches in England. Some of you are hanging around the edges. You wouldn't give a rip if the door shut on this church house. You'd just crawl off this cow and get on another cow like a tick. You better get excited. You better get a passion. You better get a burden. You better get right with God. You better have what David had. Oh, God. Oh, God, I want you the center of my life. I want you the center of our home. I want you the center of our church. Oh, God, I want you the center of our nation. He didn't just talk about it. He said, hey, boys, that ark's off down yonder. Let's go get it. But I want to tell you the second thing. He not only had a passion, but David had also had a problem. And I'm going to show you how he got there. Passion without obedience. Right, now listen to me good. Passion without obedience to the Bible is going to bring you problems. You just get it settled in your heart. If you ever get saved, it's going to be God's way, not your way. You're coming through the cross. You're coming through the blood. But you ain't coming. God didn't ask you how to be, God didn't ask you your opinion about how to be, how to save you. God didn't ask Moses his opinion how to build that thing, where to put it, how to put it, and how to carry it. God said, this is the way I want it done. 
You must be born again. That's not an option. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? I'm talking about a new creature in Jesus Christ. There's a new man living inside. You're not the person you used to be. And secondly, if you ever serve God, now listen to this, you're going to serve him how he says to serve, not the way you want to. David had a problem. Here's what his problem was. And it's, I'm, I'm telling you, boy, I'll tell you what, I had two messages this morning, didn't know which one to preach, and I ain't preaching another one tonight, I'll probably preach next Sunday. But I'm going to tell you, this thing right here got a hold of me. David had desire to serve the Lord, to get God to the center of his life, but he didn't want to obey God and do it God's way. And the reason he didn't, and watch this, this is, this is an amazing thing the Holy Ghost recorded in Scripture, is because he wasn't reading his Bible. You say, Reggie, how do you know David wasn't reading his Bible? I'll show you how I know David. And I'm going to also show you why he wasn't reading his Bible. The same reason you're not reading yours. David wasn't reading the Word. Thus, he wasn't obeying the Word. He became presumptuous which is mean that you just, you just think, well, I'm going to do this, and God, you'll have to go along with me because what I want to do he became self-willed and influenced by the world. So in verse 3 of your text today, you know what he did? He said, boys, let's take that ark of Jerusalem. Woo! And they all said, hallelujah, glory to God. He said, uh, put, that, uh, he said put, that, uh, put that ark on the cart right there. Get, go get a new cart. Put that ark on it. Put whole oxen up to it. And said, one of you guys go out in front of that thing of dancing. And said, the rest of you leave the oxen. And some of you walk alongside just in case it about falls off. There's only one problem with all that jizmero. Totally disobedient to what God had said to do. God not only told him how to build it, what to put in it, where to put it at, and everything else. He told him exactly how to carry it. And he said, if you don't do what I tell you to do, he said, you're going to have some problems. And David ran head on like I would have in a walnut tree with my eyes shut. And some of you run into a walnut tree here recently, and you're wondering, what in the world? Why don't God bless? Why am I in this trouble? Why am I having these problems? You might want to start reading your Bible. He said, uh, put that ark on a new cart. I want to ask you something. Where did David get that idea? He got it from the Philistines. Because the Philistines, it was causing them trouble. And the Philistines, they didn't know how to carry it. They weren't Israel. God never told them how to carry it. They didn't even want to be around it. It was so powerful. So they put it on an ox cart and sent it out. And somehow or another, watch this. Somehow or another, David looks at that and says, man, that's pretty cool. Let's try that at church. Boy, I like the way they had them rock concerts. Let's see if we can have one at church. Boy, I, I guess people, woo, filled with the Spirit. Like, man, I mean, tell you what. Woo, woo, woo. Where did he get the idea to carry it on a car? He didn't get it from God. He got it from the world. So here's the great truth of this little old lesson this morning's message. You're going to do God's work. You're going to worship God. You're going to walk with God. You're going to have to do it as God reveals it to you in Scripture. You ever get saved, I'm going to say it again. If you ever get saved, you've got to get saved God's way through the blood, not yours way. We've got loads of new cart churches in America now. They've got new cart Bibles. New cart Bibles. They seem like about one coming out about every year now, isn't there? New cart Bibles. Oh, my goodness, they're having a time. Isn't it wonderful to be able to tell God what to say? I think his Brother Dean walked up to me this morning and said, Reggie, have you ever heard tell somebody just taking somebody else's book and just rewriting it? I said, no, I really hadn't. I said, you know what, last time I heard, you don't just pick up uh, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin or Gone with the Wind or uh, the Shepherd of the Hills and just say, I'm going to rewrite that book. But they do it to the Bible. And they don't have a right to. And they're cursed because of it. They've touched it. We got the new cart music. Most churches are playing what, when I was 16 years old, was rock and roll. We got new cart worship, new cart music. We got new cart messages. It's all psycho babble. It makes me sick. I'll tell you what, don't you, don't ever, don't you ever bring me no glass pulpit in this room. Amen? When I see a glass pulpit, you know what I think? They went modern. I don't like it. You say, Reggie, what's that got to do with it? Hey, the Bible said that Nehemiah preached on the pulpit of wood. That's why. But there's a lot of stuff that goes with it. 
Behind that there, there's going to be a new cart music system. Drums, and they're going to have everything. And then they're going to have the light systems, all new cart stuff. Shh, don't nobody say nothing. They got a new cart doctrine. There ain't no cross to it. They don't need to repent. They don't need to believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. I put on a cartoon the other day that displays what Mormonism is all about when they come up to your door on my Facebook page. And the Mormon wrote to me and said, Reggie, I'm so disappointed in you that you'd put such a thing. We, us Christians all need to get along. There's only one problem with that. They're not Christians. I ain't pulling no new cart. But see, the new, the new cart is, well, you're, go, you're going your way, and they're all nice, and we're all going to heaven different ways. They've got a new cart. No, I'm going to tell you something. Need, that, that ain't the way it is. There's a new spirit. There's a new Jesus. He just likes anything. He don't give a rip how you dress. He don't care if you're a fornicator, an adulterer, a pervert, a sodomite. I want you to notice something. You're in there in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I want you to look at verse number 5. You watch this. Hey, folks, contemporary worship services are not new. The Bible said there's no new thing under the sun. Oh, David, he had a problem with it. Look at verse number five. And David, and all, now they've got that card, they've got that ark on the cart now, and they've got the oxen pulling it up the road, and here they go. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord. I, when's the last time you went, oh, come to church next Sunday. We're going to play. Come play with us next Sunday. <laughs> he messed up, folks. They played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made of fir wood, even on harps and psalteries and timbrels and cornets and cymbals. Man, I mean, they were p- popping up the road and bang banging them cymbals. And I'll tell you what, he was a playing in a day. You read about it. He's a dancing. Oh, I'll tell you what, he's spiritualizing all his junk. And he's totally, totally, totally out of the will of God. And he's going to get a man killed over it. Mind me of these days, Acts chapter 17. It said the Athenians spent their time in nothing more but to hear or tell us some new thing. You go to church now, it's a conspiracy theory. Have you heard the latest conspiracy theory? We got a new doctor. We, we got some new eschatology. We got some, oh, and there, there ain't nobody ever found this out. I just found this out in the Bible. Oh, I drove by a house the other day. I saw a symbol up on the side of the deal. I went and studied it out, took it, went and got on the internet, checked it all out. Oh, Reggie, have you read this book? Oh, Reggie, have you read that book? Oh, Reggie, have you read that book? I told a guy this week, I said, I don't even get this book read enough. Yeah, I'm not against reading books, but my goodness. Are we having a good time? All right, now here's what the deal was. You say, Reggie, David, uh, why? He, well, he wasn't reading the Bible. Now, either he was just straight out neglecting the Bible, or he's too busy, or he's unconcerned, we had an issue. I believe he had an issue, and I'm going to tell you why. The Bible said that a king was to write out a copy of, the old, of, of all five books of the, of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. So David had a responsibility to write out a copy himself of the book of law. David was not stupid. David wrote the Psalms. David's very, but David wasn't reading his Bible, and you know how I know? And I'm going to tell you why I think he wasn't reading the Bible. Here it is. Now, listen good. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, if you check your Bible just before the chapter, you find out David had by now six wives. Are you listening? Six wives. And then the Bible said he started adding more wives. And he's multiplying wives. We preached about that last week, right? Now, that's just the chapter before you. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, God says specifically that a king was not to multiply to himself wives. Hmm. So here's what I think happened. Now, I could be wrong, brother. Do you know what I think David was? One day he was sitting on the veranda. Bring me the roll, the scroll. I'm going to read Deuteronomy today. He's cutting on down through there, and all of a sudden he reads. That's not the king. When you get a king, Israel, he's not to multiply to himself wives. I've got 14. Uh, I'm done reading. Take it back in yonder. Now, you listen to me real well. Let me tell you what caused you to quit reading your Bible. You're going to run across something you don't like because it runs against the grain of you. Let me tell you what will get you out of church and make you quit coming here and preaching. Oh, preacher, get up Sunday and preach the very word, but preach on something you're guilty of. All of a sudden, you ain't going to taste the Bible no more. And here's Satan's trick to you. He's going to get you to read something, hear something out of the Bible that that, that you're guilty of, that you're violating, and all of a sudden, you're not really interested in reading the Bible anymore. So here's where it got him. Here's what I believe happened. 
He's reading Deuteronomy 17, 17, doesn't like what God says, closed the Bible up, says, I don't, I don't, what are you going to do this morning, David? David, you want to read the Bible again? No, I'm, I'm not in, I, we ain't got time this morning to read the Bible. What are you going to do this evening? You want to read the Bible, David, before we go to bed tonight? I ain't got time to read the Bible. We'll never get to bed. We've got to get up early in the morning. Are you listening? So then watch. It came time for David to move the ark. Now watch, this is big business. This is important. He wants, he has a, a right desire. He wants to bring the ark to Jerusalem, but he hadn't been reading his Bible. And he just decides that that's a pretty good idea. Throw it on the cart. Do it like the Philistines do it. And man, he's feeling good. But if he had read his Bible, folks, Uzzah would have never died. Not only that, they didn't get the ark where it's supposed to go. They missed the blessing. They didn't get God in their midst. All over the fact that he let a previous sin in his life that he didn't want to deal with keep him from reading the Bible. I believe that happens to us all the time. I've seen it for years. I've seen people come in here and, oh, well, I'll be going out the door. They'll see me. Oh, Brother Reggie, we've been looking for a church like this for years. We're so happy to be here. Oh, we just appreciate the messages you preach. About six months later, I preach on something their kid did, and I mean, woo, it is on. All of a sudden, I can't preach nothing they like. <laughs> they walk into church for about six months, fold their arms up and look at me like that, and then pretty soon they're on. They're gone. You know why? Because they got ticked off at something that God... I mean, I, I've done this. It happened over and over again. Preach on immodesty. Preach on something they don't like. Blah, blah, blah. It's just the way it is. Hey, God wants you now to learn something. I'll tell you what. I appreciate it. I've been a sorry dog for... 63 years, I've been a sorry dog, deserve to go to hell. But I'll tell you, I ain't never got mad at the man of God for preaching the Bible at me. I might have got mad, but I got over it at the house. Amen? Amen. I ain't never. I, I don't hold it against one man of God. The fact of it is, the older I get, the more appreciative I am of the man that got up and said, Reggie, you ain't living right. No, David, he said, I don't think I like that Bible much anymore, so I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to do it the world's way. You get on the wrong side of God and get on the wrong side of the Bible in some areas, what will happen to you, you will, you'll start not reading your Bible. And then other areas of your life going to get messed up. And I'm going to get, I want you to keep that Bible open. You look what happens here. Look down in verse number 8. Now, in verse number 7, the anger of God was kindled because Uzzah reached up and touched that ark. And the anger of the Lord has come against us, and God smote him there in verse 7 for his error, and there he died by the ark of the Lord. That's a bad place to die, right, by, by the ark. Now watch verse 8. This makes me sick. You're talking about a fleshly low-down side of David. Look at this. David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach on us, and he called the name of the place Perez uh, to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And watch this stupid question. How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? <laughs> all I was trying to do was serve God. All I was trying to do, all I was trying to do was walk with God. And look what God had happened. It don't pay to serve God. What are you doing, God? That's what he's doing. And then he has the audacity. How shall the ark come to me? I believe it made God sick, and it makes me sick. You know what that is? That's modern-day victimization. He made a victim out of himself. Poor me. Instead of bucking up and being a man, said, boys, what did we do wrong? Somebody get the Bible out here. We must have done something wrong. He blamed God. Went into a whining fit. I'm sick of this country's sissified Christianity. Why don't we buck up and say, you know what, take personal responsibility and say it's what I've done wrong. It's not what somebody else did and it's not what God did. God is good. God is holy. But I'm going to give you something. God is never, God is never going to violate his word just to go along with you and I's good intentions no matter how good they may be. Listen, you know what happened? Hey, David, I, I, I can tell David why, how the ark can come up to him the same way he could have found out. Number one, don't ever imitate the world. Whatever the world's doing, don't do it. Number two, read your Bible. Numbers chapter 4, verses 1 through 15, the Bible taught explicitly that the ark was to be carried by the tribes of the Levi, and by the tribe of Levi, particularly the family of Kohath. God said, I want the tribe of Levi to carry it, and particularly the family of Kohath, nobody else is to mess with it or carry it. 
In Numbers 7, 9, that's three chapters later, God said this, The sons of Kohath were to bear the ark upon their shoulders. That ark had four rings on it. It had a ring here, a ring here, a ring there. And then the Bible said they were to make staves out of wooden goat. And they run those staves through there. And there were to be four men. They were to bear that ark upon their shoulder. Four is the number of the world. Those men were pictures of preachers and Christians who were to carry Christ to a lost and dying world in unity. You listen to me. How many knows that a church never does no good if it's not in unity? You know what most churches try to do? They carry the ark with two guys. And everybody's standing around laughing at us. God says, I want there to be unity. I want, he said, by the foolishness of preaching, men are saved. God wants you to carry the gospel with a track, with a CD. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But God uses people, not carts. And they violated it all. God said, I've told you how to carry. All David would have had to have done was to read his Bible, right? He would have found it. Well, the ends do not justify the means. What it was, was a blatant disregard and disobedience to the Bible. Oh, yeah, they were having a good time for a while. They were dancing and playing and jumping and singing in the psalteries and the timbrels and the cymbals and the trumpets. But it was a new cart. Good intentions do not make something right. Second Samuel chapter three, verse six tells us, watch this, that there's going through that threshing floor and they must have hit a, they must have hit a good old Ozark's pothole. And that cart must have done something because the Bible said the ark shook. And Uzzah, being afraid it would fall off, reached out and touched it and steadied it. That man should have been reading his Bible. Because the Bible says in Numbers 4 and verse 15 that they were not to touch it. That's why those staves were to go through the deal and they were not to touch that. And then it said this, lest he die. If Uzzah and David had read their, just simply had their morning devotions. They had just been having morning devotions along. God would have told David. But because he got ticked off at Deuteronomy 17, 17 about not having a bunch of wives, he didn't care about the rest of the Word of God anymore, and so I'm not reading the Bible now. I'm too busy. I've sat in church all my life. I know where everything is. No, anyway. Can't tell me nothing. I ain't got time to read the Bible. Making money is more important to me. I'm telling you, if you're going to stay out of trouble as a Christian, read your Bibles. God wants to give you wisdom. He wants to give you direction. You say, Reggie, David was displeased. Wait a minute, David, you're displeased at what? At God keeping his word? What are you displeased at, David? That God didn't lie and not do what he said he was going to do? You're displeased because God didn't violate his own word? God told you, David, that if any man touched that, he told you, number one, don't carry it on our cart. You carry it on four minute deal. He said, you don't touch it. If you do, somebody's going to die. The man touches is going to die. And you're mad at God for just keeping his word? Mm, what an attitude. Well, David and all of them should have known about the matter. I'll give you one more thing about this just for fun. What was pulling the cart? Oxen. What was it that came out of the fire when Aaron throwed the gold in the fire. A calf. How many knows what the symbol for Satan is in all art of the world? It has to do with the fifth cherub in the book of Ezekiel. Hooves and horns. Now watch this. This is wild. It is a picture of who's pulling even the, why, even the good desires of Christian people when they don't do stuff God's way. Who's pulling, who's pulling the, can anybody tell me who's pulling the wagon? Satan. Satan's pulling the wagon. He says, I'll pull your wagon any day if you'll just disobey God. Watch what, watch what God told, remember Samuel telling Saul, behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. <clears throat> the old devil says, 
Oh, you want to serve the Lord? I'll pull you, wagon. As long as you don't do it God's way, because God never bless what you're doing, as long as you're not doing it God's way. David may have been sincere, but sincerity, but sincerity can take you straight to hell. Sincerity can get you killed. He was sincerely wrong. He asked the question, how shall I bring up the ark? I think God said to David, go read the Bible. Remember that old song we sung? What more can he say than to you he has said? There it is. That's why the devil don't want you and I reading the Bible. Let's talk about a few practical things. We'll get out of here. You say, how can I go to heaven? Read your Bible. Find out. Except a man be born again, he kind of enter into the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. You say, well, here's another question. How do I find a mate? <clears throat> Watch me. How do I find a mate? You're going to do it the Philistine way? Or you're going to do it God's way? But how are you going to know God's way if you don't read the Bible? How should I dress? Philistine way or God's way? You see, you see where I'm coming from? You know something I ain't never heard Joyce Myers preach on? I don't know. I've never heard her preach. Okay? But I ain't never heard of her preaching on women keep silence in the church. I ain't never heard of Joyce Myers preaching on, oh, here's a new message, Joyce Myers. Bishop should be the husband of one wife. You know why she don't preach on that? Does anybody know? Because she don't like in scriptures. <laughs> yeah. So then you go into psychobabble. It's all psychology now. Stuff that'll make people feel good and send money in. How to operate as a spouse. Philistine way. New cart way. Well, if I get mad and don't like them anymore, don't feel like I love them, I leave. What's God say? Permanent. What did you say? Death part. I mean, how do I raise my children? Philistine way in front of the TV. With a little game deal in their hand all day long. We're in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we wonder down the road why something fell apart and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the party was over. How should my children be educated? Philistine way, the Bible way. How do I know right from wrong? Watching The View? Or for Winfrey, listen to Rush Limbaugh? Or do I read my Bible to find out what's right and wrong? How do I take care of my finances? How do I run my inner life? What do I do with what Zach talked about if I'm getting bitter? How do I handle it? About my attitude? All that. How do I handle offenses and hurts? Shoot them or forgive them? <laughs> you know, isn't it funny? It seems like the last thing we do is read our Bible. We'll search the Internet. Oh, man, you ought to see what I found on the Internet. Oh, you should have seen what came down my feed on Facebook. Oh, man, have you read this book? You should have seen that show. Oh, man, have you seen that movie? But when's the last time you said this? I am, I, I, I am not going anywhere else. I'm going to get the Bible, and I'm going to read and study until God gives me the answer. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how this changed my life. I was in the back old study room we had where the old wood stove was in our old mobile home. And I was wrestling with eternal life. I was raised and believed that you could lose your salvation. I was reading my Bible, started reading my Bible after I got saved, and some stuff wasn't matching. Bad wasn't matching. And I read over in First John one night. He said, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaining in him, and he cannot sin because he was born of God. Well, I just got through reading over a while ago where it said, If any man say it hath no sin, it truth not in him. I could amen that verse, but I couldn't amen that other verse. And I said, Lord, I don't, I don't know. You say one side here, the man says he doesn't sin, he's a liar and truth's not in him. I can agree with that. You say, well, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he's born of God. Lord, I, I've sinned. I'm a preacher, Lord. I've been saved, and I, I'm preaching, and, but, Lord, I sin. I don't understand it. And it's just like my old flesh said, well, go find a commentary somewhere. 
But the Holy Spirit of God said, get in this book. And I bowed my head that night. I'll never forget that night. Bowed my head on my Bible. I said, God, I'm not going to nowhere. I'm not going to go talk to some preacher. I'm not going to go get somebody's book. God, all I want to know is the truth. But if you'll show it to me, Lord, I, I'll believe the truth if you'll show it to me. And all of a sudden, it's just like a still, small voice said, that's where I wanted you to get. Bridget, don't you remember reading about the old man and the new man? Don't you remember reading in Galatians about the spirit and the lusteth against the flesh and the flesh? Because I never had a clue about the two natures. I, I didn't understand. I never knew about it. And all of a sudden, the Bible that I've been reading all of a sudden just started unfolding like a flower. And all of a sudden, I looked back at the ark and I saw Noah letting out the raven and I saw him letting out the dove. And all of a sudden, I saw Jacob and Esau. And all of a sudden, I just started weeping because the Holy Ghost of God had honored the decision to read the Bible to find out. Because I had a problem. Let me tell you what my problem was. I was at a point where I was said, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to walk in behind that pulpit and act like I never sin. And so, Lord, if you can get me to where I never sin, I guess I'll keep preaching. Well, you've got to show me what the truth is. Because I'm not going to get up there and act like I never sin. Anyway, I think I'm done. Lord, am I done? Last thing I want to say to you, there's punishment. A man died, and they all had good intentions. A lot of things can happen to us having good intentions. All I ask you to do today is go home. You've got a problem in life, or you've got a situation in life. I ask you to get this old book out and say, Dear God, please show me what I need to do. Please show me what I need to do. There's not a problem in your life what God can't show you the direction, the way to go. I think I'm done. I believe God's done. I want to be done when God's done. Amen. God, I want to be done when the Lord's done. Let's stand together. <clears throat> we praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine glory. Revive us again. With our heads bowed, I want to I want to ask you to do something right now. I want, I'm encouraging you and asking you to pray to God right now. Lord, give me a passion for your word and for your work. But God, help me to always let you, you tell me through your word how I'm to go. Lord, I want to raise my family for God. But Lord, help me to look to your word for how to get that done. Lord, help me not to be presumptuous. Help me to know that you've given it. What more can you say than you've already said? God, give me a love and a hunger for the Bible. If I don't get anything else in life done, I'm going to read the owner's manual before I start working on the truck. Lord, we love you today. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, for recording David's life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us the chance, the opportunity, Lord, to see where we could avoid mistakes and trouble and problems. Lord, I confess to you that I've been so guilty of doing the very same thing David's done. I've got to do God's work, and here's how I think it needs to go. Lord, help us today to look solidly to your word, to rightly divide the word of truth, and to make sure that what we're doing lines up with the word of God so that those that are following us and depending on us, Lord, will not be hurt. Love you, Lord. Bless these people, Lord, real good, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have a wonderful day today. Tonight I'll be preaching, Lord willing.